<clears throat> the views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of any major corporation whatsoever. Well then, Bunfeld, that's Seinfeld, but a, but a bunny Seinfeld. You see the general, you know, gist of what I'm going for. Yeah. Well then, Bunfeld, let's talk about books. You see, people always say, hey, Steve, how are you so damn handsome all the time? To which I reply... Like father, like son, and my father was also a self-centered a-hole. People, people also say, hey, write what you know. And what I know is that I have been a loyal and hardworking employee, so you know, uh, at my local bookstore for almost 17 years now. Yes. If my career history was a person, then my career's voice would be changing there would be acne and there would be hair where there wasn't hair before yes that's from that's from uh fuzzy bunny's guide to you know what from the simpsons <laughs> that's i believe that's the episode where millhouse gets a girlfriend and as such, I really do have my fingers on the pulse of the book world, and I am here to thrust my fingers deep into your mouth hole with this week's soul-aligning installment of Notes from the Bookstore! Now, we have been occasionally discussing the origin story of Mr. Steve. See, this is what I was talking about earlier. I yeah. wrote it in the occasionally part. Um, when last we left off, it was 2002 and our hero, let's call him Steve for legal reasons. This is a story. He was forced to tuck his tail behind his legs and move back in with his parents in Sacramento, California. The first thing that Steve had to do when he learned that he would have to move to Sacramento, California, is like the majority of the world would also say in this situation. First things first, where the hell is Sacramento, California? Because uh, when people think California, yes. they do not think of its capital. It is where eight is enough was set. That's what I oh, know. Really? Eight is enough. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. Was in so Sacramento. Yeah. So, oh, well, that's so that's how I always picture it. I don't picture yeah. in L.A. like a big city. I, I picture it as a, a busy suburb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that. That's that makes sense. So, um, Eleanor, you're fine, baby. You're fine. So Steve was forced to tuck his tail behind his legs and move in with his parents, Sacramento, California, which is where he also transferred at his job. Transferring is very easy with this, uh, let's say, corporation. Uh, very easy. I have known throughout the years people who basically are sort of um, like wandering the globe transferring from store to store to store yes i've i've worked with at least three people who have worked in big stores in new york and they will not shut up about it <laughs> and there, but, there know, is a store in colorado springs you know just tossing that out there you know because I, okay. I, I i really worry for your safety in fucking oklahoma dude Oh, God, no, I look so Native American. I look so Native American that I get less racism here than I did in Arizona and California. Yeah. The racism that I got in California sucked because it was it was well-meaning racism. Yeah. 
the racism that I got in Arizona was straight up angry old white people from Sun City that were pissed off that that a Mexican had to help them. In California, it was the it was an equal amount of racism, but it was a uh, 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 a ponytailed yuppie in shoes that are more expensive than my car walking up to me and saying, oh, uh, uh, maybe this person uh, can help me with a book. Let me ask him. Uh, Un momento, senor. Uh, Donde esta la? And I'm like, I don't speak Spanish, dude. I'm sorry. (laughs) It's like, oh, I'm sorry. I thought if I spoke in your native language and I'm like, okay, I know that's well-meaning, but that's racist. Yes, that's, yes, that's but, but it's an amount of racism right. than an angry white person. But what I want to point out is that in particular is liberal racist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got so much liberal racism. You, you know, you get you get conservative, republic, whatever kind of racist. It's a lot more angry. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Liberal but, oh, racism, no, they, they think they're right. They think that that's the thing to do. Yeah. Oh, everybody was so well-meaning. So well-meaning. Like, oh, you know what? No, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I don't want to go to that restaurant. I want authentic Mexican food at yeah. an authentic Mexican restaurant. Where should we go? Let's ask Steve. Steve, where <laughs> would you go for authentic Mexican food? I don't know. My mom. Why are you asking me this? Why me? Yeah. Why did you single me out and ask me? This is suspicious. Yeah, mm-hmm. liberal racism happened yeah. to me all the time. Just, just like, just like liberal conspiracies. Yeah. You know, now, now the liberals don't have as many conspiracies. You know, whereas the right is fucking nuts with conspiracies. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. But David Avocado Wolf. That's what he's preaching. Yeah. You know, the 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 more liberal Gwyneth Paltrow, same thing, preaching yep. the liberal conspiracies. Big Pharma is evil. We hate Monsanto. Um, coconut oil will heal everything. Yeah. Huh? GMOs. GMOs. Yeah, that's that's a very big. Liberal conspiracy I am such a, thing. I am such a big fan of GMO. Like for reals, they played at the Arizona State Fair, yeah. and I went nuts when they started singing, "Don't let me down, Bruce." <laughs> like, I, the entire crowd went nuts when GMO started playing. Yeah, you know they played a lot of their classic stuff, and I was happy about that. No one, no one wants to to hear your new record. And I love how the front guy, whose name escapes me at the moment. How, like, he is seriously famous in the music world. Yeah. Like, he's written a lot of Tom Petty songs and things like that. He was a traveling Wilbury. Okay. Oh, God, I love the traveling Wilburys. Mm hmm. Loved them. Freaking love them. Yeah. So, so I find that. I find that interesting that this guy is so like famous kind of behind the scenes and nobody in the real world really know him. Yes. <laughs> you, know? You, you know, you know what the, you know what the, you know what that sort of same thing is. Uh, you remember the song, uh, what's going on. That was like a one hit wonder from the band Four non blondes. And yeah. people go, oh yeah, man. Hey, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. One, they had that one big hit, and then they went nowhere. But apparently, the woman who wrote that song and was the 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 front woman for that band became a style guru and songwriter who was responsible for 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 for, for like like Pink and Avril Lavigne yeah. and a bunch of other. If you can think of a female musician within the past. 10 years who's kind of tried to pass herself off as a bit of an alternative badass it was probably the woman who wrote what's going on who created that look nice yeah super massively successful yeah yeah love that sort of thing 
So anyway, Steve is moving to Sacramento, California. Steve was not happy about that. Oh, but his brother was. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Steve's brother was excited. My older brother, Joe, or occasionally Jose, when he wants to cash in on um, uh, affirmative action. Yes. Uh, he moved to Sacramento about 10 months or so before uh, I moved to Sacramento. And he was super excited for me to be there. Like, oh, oh, my God, Stevie, you can be my wingman. Uh, I, I know where all the cool bars are. You're going to hang out with me. And it's going to be so cool. It's going to be Steve and Joe. And we're going to be hanging out and drinking. Oh, man, I know where all the cool places are. I'll take you to all of them. Yeah. There's a sport bar. And it, it and it's like, okay, so you just want me to be your sidekick. I'm going to be the Morty to your Rick, basically. Yes. Okay, this is going to be fun for me. So there were like two or three bars that he would hang out at all the time. Yeah. But the main bar was a dive bar called the maple room and it's still there i remember the first time that he took me in there oh man this place is so cool like you can't smoke any in any bars in california but this place is independently owned and so technically it's like a it's like a club and in, a, 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 every person who works here has a equal stake in the in the ownership of the place and because of this whatever you can smoke inside here so it's awesome and you you walk in and you just automatically get slapped in the face by like this nasty ass smell because yeah. every person who likes to smoke is at this dirty ass bar yeah and my brother had this other tiny dirty ass dirt bar by our house in arizona and so i remember the first time i went into the maple room it's like oh my god you do you not notice that this is the exact same bar we would go to in Arizona, <laughs> except now everything that's on the left is on the right and everything on the right is on the left. This is literally the exact same place. You've taken me here before it was in Arizona and there were more white people. Yes. I'm so confused. <laughs> You've traded this bar for the exact same thing. I'm so confused by this. So, yeah, the Maple Room. I, I we all called it the Dirt Bar because it was literally like one of the worst places. And, and uh, that's and that's why I I love the Dirt Bar story so much because I know that bar. There is. I've a, been in that bar. I've I've hung out at one of those bars. Yeah, there's a comforting desperation to it. Yes. Like there are nicer places and friendlier places. And this place is like a dirty middle of nowhere dive bar. But you are now going to a tiny place all the time where everyone knows who you are. Yes. And it's like, oh, yeah, I could go to all these really nice places with a nicer class of people where there might not be a fight. But. Oh my God, everyone knew me. And, and, you know, only a couple of months in, you, you would walk in there literally at any time of the day and just Steve. And there was just yeah. something so comforting to that. Like, Oh my God, I hate this place. Let's keep going here. Mm -hmm. My brother would say, like, I would question my brother about it before we became regulars at the maple room. And he would say, I would rather be a big fish in a small pond than a small fish in a big pond. And that's why I like going to the maple room. Okay. And it's like, okay, I understand that. That's, that's fair. My, my, my older brother at the time, he was very gun ho. Very serious about me not being weird. Okay. That was his big Stevie, just, Hey, I want these people to like me. Okay. I've been coming here for a couple months and they like me. But I want them to keep liking me, so don't do your weird stuff, okay? Like, I don't know what you're talking about. No, I know you know what I'm talking about. Don't do your weird things. Don't be talking about Ed Wood. Don't be, you know, converting people. Don't be doing crazy stuff. Just just, just, just be cool, okay? You got to be my wingman, all right, Stevie? Just be cool. That is so, so what? I'm sorry, but that is so sad and pathetic. <laughs> yeah. He was just so desperate to have all of the people at the bar like him. And then, like, I'm just going there and I'm being myself. And after just a, a couple of days, people are like, oh, my God, Stevie, you're 
you're you're so awesome. Hey, come hang out with us. We're we're gonna be going to this place tomorrow. Can you come without Joe? <laughs> And hey, can you do us a favor? Can you have Joe stop talk? Can you have your brother stop talking about Arizona all the time? He's constantly talking about Arizona, and it's really annoying. It's like you don't live there anymore. You live here. <laughs> so one day I just I had enough of it. And I'm and I'm like I'm going to do the weirdest thing I, I can think of. I was done being my brother's freaking sidekick. So against his better wishes, one day I just decided to say screw it. And, um, like f- four nights a week, it was a karaoke bar from like seven to close. And we would all put in songs and stuff. And yeah. And my brother would learn these songs to try and seem like a badass. I remember the day that he, uh, memorized, uh, Jump Around by House of Pain. Okay. You really haven't lived. Oh, yeah. And he would sing a lot of Tool. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, okay. It, I, I'm sure you think that you're a badass singing tool, uh-huh. but um, just to let you know, once you're done, some redneck guy is going to sing "Friends in Low Places" and he's going to get ten million more claps than you. <laughs> well, I had I had an actual system. I did so much karaoke. I had a system, and I would say to people like, oh, Joe, check this out. I'm going to do something really funny. Don't do anything weird. Don't do anything weird. And I'm like, no, this is going to be really funny. So I would like sing some classic song that I knew all of the old people at this dirt bar would love. Yeah. So I so I would immediately sing some classic song like Frank Sinatra or Neil Diamond or uh, some like a old Elvis song. And I would do this first so that on my way from the stage back to our table, I would immediately get stopped by like five old white dudes who up until the point I started singing were racist as hell. <laughs> there are all these old people that are just like, oh, what the hell is this guy going to sing? And then I start singing like a song from Guys and Dolls. And then, you know, suddenly this like 87 year old veteran is just like, excuse me, sir. I just wanted to shake your hand. That was a damn fine song, son. How do you even know a song like that? <laughs> I go back to the table, and Joe's like, I thought you were going to do something funny. And I'm like, that was funny. Did you see those three old white guys shake my hand? That was fucking hilarious. <laughs> so once I was done with the song that I that I wanted everybody to hear, yeah, then I can kind of start doing whatever song I want to do. Yeah. Now that I've got now that I've got them in the palm of my hand. But one day I was just sick of being my brother's sidekick. So like I screw it. So I I I sang a hardcore heavy metal scream at the top of my lungs version of Britney Spears hit me baby one more time. <laughs> I remember the first time I sang it, it was like a scene from a movie because early in I'm doing this and my brother is like covering his face in shame and embarrassment. Yeah. Like, oh my God, he's not my brother. I've never seen that guy before in my life. I don't know who that person is. But slowly the entire bar is like, oh my God, what's this guy doing? And cheering and on the top of their feet. And it it was like a movie. It was like a scene from a movie. By the end of the thing, people are buying me rounds, buying shots and stuff. And it got to the point where I, where like literally like we go to the karaoke bar the next day and we walk in and my brother's like, don't sing that Britney Spears song, okay? You embarrass me. You don't do that. You can't do weird stuff. So we go into the bar, and then everybody's like, there he is, there he is. Hey, are you going to sing Britney Spears tonight? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I guess so. Oh, my God. He's going to do it, everybody. He's going to do it. I And I made a name for myself Yeah. with this stupid song. There was actually, a, like... Like maybe like the third or fourth time I did it, there was a there was a reporter for an indie newspaper. Yeah, that was there, and it, it's oh, it, it's it's weird. We we didn't expect this, but we're writing an article for this magazine about uh, going to karaoke, and we want to interview you. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it was one of those ones that's like free by the door at the record store and junk. Yeah. So I became known 
for this one karaoke song, which which is which is odd. People would like seek me out, and that is how I met I my new best friends, uh, Jason, Ricky, and Colleen. Yes. Ha! Ha! Shut up. Ha! <laughs> okay, so we got here. We got here. I love you. And I knew we would get here. There's some painful memories, but look. Um, this is not the Steve's personal life show. Although, when Ricky does try to kill me, it is during a smoke break at the bookstore, so this is all related. Uh-huh. Yes. That is true. So let's pause that for a mo and go back to the bookstore. Like now, Mo Sal- Sla- 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 Mo Mo Sizlak. I thought you were trying to say most deaf, and I'm like, why are you tripping on that? It's just deaf. Sizlak. Mo Sizlak. Let's I'm pause that. that yeah, let's pause that for a most. Let's pause that for a sizzlack. Okay. And go back to the bookstore. Now, most bookstores in this specific corporation happen to look exactly alike. You go to a store in this state, and then if you go to a store in another state, there's a good chance it'll look exactly the same. However, yes. this store, which is in Sacramento, California, by a mall, in the like in the '60s and '70s and 80s, and a bit of the 90s, this store in Sacramento was originally a big supermarket. Really? Yeah. Okay. And, and then uh, the supermarket left, and for some strange reason, a major corporation said, that supermarket, we can turn that into a bookstore. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, we, we can turn that into a bookstore. And also, the the fact that it used to be a supermarket is why occasionally the receiving department would be cold as hell. Yeah. Super cold. Okay. Super freezing cold. And I miss that. Let me tell you, I miss that sometimes in my receiving department where the air conditioning isn't really working right now and I'm sweating my ass off. Yeah. The, the, the receiving manager at that store when I first moved there was a girl named Q. Okay. Exactly like um, the the guy from The Next Generation. Her name was Q. Uh-huh. And uh, let me try and describe Q, the uh, receiving manager. Uh, picture saw a woman in a roller derby. Okay. Okay, that was Q. I got it. Okay. Okay. She was like six foot a billion and she had a lot of tattoos and piercings and colored hair and was really in your face and didn't care about you. Yeah. Like it was surprising. She didn't work at a record store. (laughs) The first time I ever met her, she was trying to convince one of the managers to let her go early because she was having a heavy flow day. Okay. I don't think she was having a heavy flow day. She just knew the manager hated it when she started talking about heavy flow days. <laughs> but you got to let me go. I'm having a heavy flow day. It's a heavy flow, a very heavy flow. The flow is heavy. It's like, seriously, Q, can you please stop? I can't stop. It's a heavy flow day. <laughs> I'm picturing people in rowboats. Yeah, 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 very much so. Yeah, it's it's uh it's uh it's Houston, Texas down there. The store wasn't technically part of the mall. There was a a big mall. Yeah. There there was a big huge mall and then there was a small parking lot. And then there was a uh tire place. And then there was another small parking lot. And then there was kind of a mall annex. Yes. It was weird because they had, you know, it, there was like a like a, a big store. And then there was us. And then there were a bunch of restaurants and a movie theater. And, and you know, it, it was it was a it was a subsection of the mall. Technically, we weren't part of the mall. Yeah. It was a mall annex. A bizarre smattering of other stores. Uh, but technically, we weren't part of the mall. But every Christmas, every Christmas, 
they would say, uh, hey, it's the Christmas season now, the holiday season, and we want to make sure that all of these parking spots, all of these parking spaces are for the customers who are going to be spending money in our location. So if you work in any way, if you... I don't know where... That's why I'm asking you to hand me those. Okay. So if you work in any way at any of our locations at the mall, this is what you need to do. Uh, three blocks away uh. is the state fairgrounds. You need to park there and then wait for a shuttle, which will appear every 15 to 30 minutes. Yeah. And they will take you to your work. And then uh, employees would say, okay, that's crazy. I'm just going to park in the parking lot. And then the, the mall management said, that's fine if you want to do that. But just to let you know, if we see any employees parking in this parking, in our parking area, we will boot your car. Oh. And they did. Every Christmas. But let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I never once parked at the state fairgrounds. Good. Especially the last couple of years, I realized that that here we were in like the mall annex, the bizarre small mall annex. And then there was a large parking lot. And then there were a few other stores. There was a Best Buy and there was a, uh, a, a Toys R Us and there was a, a Burger King, home of the flame broiled Whopper, which did eventually burn down in a bizarrely, in a bizarrely ironic uh, uh, bit of irony, I guess. And uh, some furniture store, I think. Um, and I, I always said, you know what? I bet Best Buy doesn't have to do this. I bet the Best Buy people don't have to go park at the state fairground and then wait a half hour for a shuttle and then go to work. So you know what? I'm just going to go park at the Best Buy. And I did, and it worked. I was never booted once. No one ever gave me a problem because nobody cared about the Best Buy people. Yes. <laughs> so, so, so there was a bizarre smattering of other stores, including a movie theater, Eventually, they heard about my amazing story times, and they uh, had me do some regular story times in the lobby of their movie theater. Uh, and in exchange for which, I was treated as an employee and could get into the movies with my kids whenever I wanted to for free. Yes. That was my theater, and I loved it. There was also a Mexican restaurant, and this I had completely forgotten about the existence of this place until I was writing all of this. Max's Opera Cafe. Okay. It was a fancy sit-down, high-class, hoity-toity restaurant. And uh, there was also a, a piano player, and they'd be playing a, you know jazz songs, real classy sort of joint. Yeah. But then, at any period in time, one of your waiters or waitresses might be called up to the piano where they would sing a song. Yes. Technically, it was called Max's Opera Cafe, and every once in a while you would get a beautiful operatic singer singing a beautiful opera number, but what they really should have called the place was Max's Disney Musical Cafe. Okay. Because you might hear La Traviata, you might hear uh, uh, Pagliacci, more yes. than likely, you will be hearing a uh, uh, part of our part of your world from Little Mermaid. Yes. Or can you feel the love tonight? <laughs> it's called Max's Opera Cafe, but more than likely, you will be painting with all of the colors of the wind. <laughs> there was also a big Virgin megastore, which in America used to be a thing. Yeah. Weird. It, it was bizarre. Like, uh, yeah, they eventually closed down. But for a small period in time, we technically worked right next door to the third largest Virgin Megastore in the, on the planet. Really? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's weird. Uh, yeah, my first Christmas with my parents, they asked me what I wanted for Christmas. And I 
I was like, okay, I'm I'm like 23 and I'm confused by this question. But let me think of something. You know what? I want a Game Boy Advance. I want a Game Boy Advance. Yeah. Can you get me a Game Boy Advance? My dad said, yes, of course, I can get you a Game Boy Advance. But my dad had the habit of not buying any Christmas presents until Christmas Eve in a mad huff. Okay. So what he got me that Christmas was the Lord of the Rings, the two towers for the Game Boy Advance, which he said was a promise to him, was a promise to me that he would eventually be getting me a Game Boy Advance. Okay. Because why would he get me this game if I wasn't going to eventually be given a Game Boy Advance? I never got my Game Boy Advance is what I'm saying, Bunny. Yes. Had a feeling that's where it was going. But I've got the Lord of the Rings, the two towers somewhere. <laughs> which is weird. Fuckers. So, uh, so it was believed that despite my nearly two years with the company, that I was an inexperienced noob. So I was put on shelving duty. Yes. And for a ridiculously long time, I don't know, like a year, year and a half, I had to get there two hours before opening and shell. Yes. Interesting fact, I now look at this time with uh, a, a fond, it's a fond memory because now we hardly have time for anyone to shelve. And uh, there is not a single store in this nation that is still crazy enough to burn hours in the way that you would. We're going to have three different people come in two hours before we open just to shelve books. No store does that anymore. Yeah. It's all about cutting corners and saving hours. No store is crazy enough to do this. But back in the day, apparently we had hours to burn. So I would just I would wake up crazy early. And there are some things you can do when you're 20 and you're 30 years old that you there is no way that I can do now yeah. that I am 40 years old. I cannot go to a smoky ass bar and drink until 2 a.m., stagger home, pass out, and then be at work at 7 a.m. Yeah. That is an absolute impossibility, and I have no idea how I did it, but I did it pretty much every night. I was literally closing the bar five to six nights a week. Yeah. Uh, and I have no idea how I did this, but I did. And all the time I shelled with two other employees, uh, Liz and Kai. Liz was in eventually the kids lead and she was cool. She was blonde. She was funny. She was attractive. She had a Boba Fett tattoo. And I'm also pretty sure that she's one of two or three employees that would take regular pot breaks in the parking lot. Yes. But I okay. but I'm the one who would get a boot. Yeah. You know? It's always how it is. I kinda sorta went on a date with Liz once. There was a big groovy ghoulies concert. Yeah. This one really horrible nightclub like wooden hideous place way out in the middle of nowhere that like all the cool concerts would go to. And uh I I said, hey, I'm going to this concert. Do you want to come with me? And she's like, yeah, no, that would be really cool. Let me invite four of our other employee friends. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, great. Well, I'll meet you all there. <laughs> oh, crap. This isn't a date anymore. Okay, fine. Yeah. But one of the bands, this is a, this is, uh, this is, I've never told anyone this before. One of the bands that night, it, it was a, a CD release party for a band called the mall rats. They were from Sacramento, California, and they com they were comprised of members of other punk bands in Sacramento. And they released an album and I really, really liked it. It had a lot of really good, simple melodies. It sounded basically like, like Buddy Holly, but he just did cocaine. Yeah. So it was just some simple Buddy Holly kind of rock melodies just sped the hell up. 
And I had that <laughs> album of theirs. I bought the album of theirs and I loved it and I listened to it all the time. And then they broke up and they went their separate ways and they were like an indie band and nobody had ever heard of them and they disappeared. And so when I started putting stuff on YouTube, I, I, I'm like, okay, I'm going to use this popular song and this popular song and this popular song and stuff, of course, started getting uh, flagged and removed and stuff. So I said, dang it, I need music but I need music that no one could ever sue me for. So I like way back in like 2006, 2007, I started using music from the mall rats. Yeah. And none of it's ever been flagged <laughs> because who's going to flag that they were an unsigned band that broke up forever ago that, that no one would ever remember. Yeah. So I've been using their music fairly regularly. So if you're a YouTuber out there and you're looking for music, the Mall Rats, Sacramento, California, Google search that. It's some pretty good music that you can use in the background that you won't get uh, flagged or sued for. Just FYI. Cool. For you guys. Yeah. So um, Kai, he was one of the cool guys. Yeah. He was one of the cool guys. K-A-I, Kai. He fancied himself a rapper, and he was actually pretty good. Like, during his breaks and his lunches and stuff, you could oftentimes find him in the break room with, like, a with like a, like a, a stereo, like, with headphones on, like, working on beats and writing out songs and stuff. Yeah. He was a real cool guy, and we got along. He was, he, we both liked wrestling, and, 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 you know, I wanted to be cool. And have mm-hmm. people like me, so we we got along well. We, but but that being said, he was into rap, and I had just no frame of reference. I remember one day, uh, he was outside smoking with Diana, and I'm like, "Hey, what are you guys talking about?" And Kai's like, "Oh, we're talking about where we were when Tupac died." I remember I cried. I'm I'm not ashamed to admit that. I cried the day Tupac died. Where were you, Steve, when Tupac died? And I'm like, oh, yes, of course, I remember that. And I also cried because I w- want you guys to like me. <laughs> it's like, I'm sorry, I've got no frame of reference. The same thing happened when uh, Ricky and Colleen said, you know, I cried the day the Intimidator died. Yeah. What about you, Steve? Oh, yes, I also cried the day that the Intimidator died. He was a car driver. Yeah. 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 But but Kai he he always wanted to be a musician, wanted to be a rapper and he worked on an album of demos and you know eventually he he left the store and and we went our separate ways but one day uh, a guy at work his name was Nick and he had a horrible attitude and he hated everybody but he was good friends with one of the managers Perry and so he was kind of allowed to continue having this horrible attitude and hate customers right. because he's also babysitting one of the manager's uh kids nice so, okay yeah. see how that so, goes yeah yeah so he got a pass for his hideous attitude Okay, and one day Nick said, hey, you remember Kai? And I'm like, yeah, I remember Kai. He was like one of the cool guys. And he's like, yeah, uh, you know that demo he was always working on? And I'm like, yeah, and he said, I've got a copy. I've got it. Do you want it? And I'm like, hell yeah, I want yeah. it. Give me a copy of that. I want Kai's demo. And I remember, you know, like, oh, man, I got Kai's demo. And three years later, I got Kai's demo. I'm going to listen to this. And I, I listened to one track, and I'm like, Okay, I guess that's pretty good. Listen to track two. I guess that's pretty good. I I don't entirely know rap. That's pretty good, I guess. Listen to track three. That that's pretty good, I guess. I I, I don't really know rap. Listen to track four. I, I guess that's pretty good. And then eventually you get to track seven, where he samples Michael freaking McDonald. <laughs> you know, uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. I love this song. And I copied it. I put it on my iPod, which shows you the, the time period that we're in here. Yes. And I was listening to it constantly. I was constantly listening to the song. And I will admit that at first it was an ironic listen. Yes. <laughs> 
I, I maybe like one or two more. I will admit that in the beginning it was like an ironic listen, but here's the thing. I'm going to put Kai on pause and start talking about Kirk Cameron. Okay. Because um, Nana and Papa, uh, uh, Natasha's uh, mom and dad, they, they, of course, are very Christian and very conservative. So one day Papa <laughs> came home with the Kirk Cameron Left Behind box set of all three Left Behind films. Oh, no. And I'm like, you know, I like bad movies. Papa, can I borrow your Left Behind? And and he's like, yeah, do you want the box set? No, just the first one to start me off. Yeah. And then if I like this one, I'll ask for the others. Yeah. So I watched it, and of course it's horrible. It's a horrible film. But then you get to the ending and and like the theme to Left Behind starts playing and it's like this Christian rap song called Left Behind. Yeah. And it literally sounds like they're going for like a boy band feel, but like a decade too late. <laughs> and it's this horrible song. And it's one of those songs where it's like, oh, it's a Christian song. But because this is a Christian song, we can't overtly say that it's Christian. So let's just say that. The chorus is just, we don't want to be left behind. One day you're going to come and take my soul away. I don't want to be left behind. And so it's like, it's Christian, but it could not be Christian. Yeah. Just in case. Uh, you know, the way Christian songs are. I've I've been watching a show on YouTube called Godless Cranium, who is a, a, an atheist, you know, there are a few atheist shows where they do reply videos to Christian videos. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And he will usually play a Christian rap video at the end of his shows. Yeah. So I've seen okay. a lot of... Okay, good, good. So you understand. Yes. So I downloaded the theme to Left Behind, and I started listening to it as a joke. And then I started listening to it some more, and then it became just a regular rotation on my phone. And now it gets to the point where it got to the point where literally like a year and a half ago, I'm in receiving and I'm working and I'm playing my music. And suddenly um, a farm boy veteran comes up to me and says, Steve, is this the theme to Left Behind? <laughs> I'm like, yes, it is. It is the theme to Left Behind. And he goes, oh, wow. Why are you listening to it? It's like, wait, I like what I like. Yeah. I just like what I like, and, and I don't care what other people think of it. Yeah. I, I've listened to this song for so long that I can now say, I like this song. <laughs> and I'm not saying that Kai's song was horrible, but at first I was listening to it as a joke. But then after... But then, like, a year later, I'm still listening to it, and Natasha says, oh, turn that, why do you keep listening to Kai's song? Turn that off. I, I don't like that song. And then two years later, I'm still listening to it, and Natasha starts singing along a little bit. And then, like, you know, a year later, I'm listening to it, and then my kids are singing along with it. <laughs> and then, like, a year later, it, it comes on on my phone, and me and all the kids are in the kitchen dancing to it, and it gets to the point now where I'm listening to it at work, and I'm like, I love this freaking song. I love this song so much. Now that I've been listening to it for like a, a decade, yeah, I, I I I can look at it in different with different eyes and different ears. I can look at it with different ears. I just said that out loud because I'm a professional podcaster and I yes. do words good. <laughs> um, I hear the song now as a classic rap song. In the sense that in the 90s, it became gangster rap and I'm going to kill you. I am better than you. Yeah. I'm going to pop a cap in your ass and fuck bitches. And then like in the 2000s, it became um, I am a better rapper than you. My rap song is about how I am better at rapping than you. And then nowadays, it's more about... Check out my extravagant lifestyle. I've got millions of dollars, and I ride this nice car, and yeah. I fuck bitches. But 
But back in the 80s, you heard a rap song and it could literally just be a guy telling a story or a guy talking about his life or a guy talking about how his life isn't that good. Yes. It's weird to hear a rap song in the 80s and have it be about, I live in a bad neighborhood. Here's my life. And now you listen to songs now and it's just, Crystal, check out my gold ring. And, but back in the 80s, it was a story. And that's how I hear Kai's song now. It's a story. It's something that you could hear in the radio in 1984. Yes, or 1987, and it's it. I I it's a damn good song, and I am still friends with Kai on Facebook, and I talked to him, and he gave me the okay to play it on the podcast. So we're having a musical interlude, folks. Yeah. And I'm so excited about this. We're going to be playing Kai's song. FYI, I shot you the song uh, on the uh, cloud. Yes, the Pope on film. Uh, cloud that we have so it's there technically i didn't know what to call kai do i just call him kai like madonna when i was first putting it onto my ipod i thought what do i call him so i called him kai the bookseller Uh uh-huh technically that is his artist name and i wasn't sure what the song was called because i just got a copy of the demo i didn't get like liner notes or anything like that so i just called it like a fool and so that's what I listed it as. And uh, a few years ago, I did ask Kai if I could get his okay, his blessing, to uh, put the song as a free download on my blog. And he said, okay. So I kind of sort of feel like a music producer here when, I, when I'm when i talking about this song. Yes. Because I did release it. I released this song for Kai a couple of years ago. Kai, the bookseller. And I, I listed the song as Like a Fool. But recently he, he said, yeah, you can use it on your podcast. I'm kind of honored that you would uh, put this song on your podcast. Just to let you know, the song is called A Fool Believes. <laughs> and I'm like, damn, for a decade I've been calling it like a fool. And now he's trying to challenge me. So I, the way that I see the title is, the title of the song is A Fool Believes, because that's the artist's intent, parentheses, like a fool and then brackets in parentheses the bookseller song okay that's how I see the title wait a second. just no that's how i see it wait a second i'm gonna have to get that in my notes yeah if you want to write that down that's fine but this is how i see the song okay title list okay give me that again first off the artist is kai the bookseller K I K I A K A I K A I Kai the bookseller. I All called right. the album uh, "Bookstore Raps," but that 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 can be changed. The song is called "A Fool Believes," and then parentheses like a fool, Hold and on. then brackets in parentheses. The bookseller song. It's complicated, I know, but I want to get it right. Because <laughs> I am the music producer here. Kind of, sort of. Okay. I've given this song already. I've given this song, uh, I think, more exposure than it has gotten. So, I, you know. Okay. Okay, I got it. Okay, uh, hold on for a second. What? What girl? Oh, yes. Is it in there? I think so. I, I yes. Yeah, I believe so. Okay. Yeah, it's somewhere. I looked in there. Yeah, I'm not sure. So anyway, uh, now we would like to. Uh, what? Okay. So now we would like to bring to you a musical interlude, a song from Kai the Bookseller, Sacramento's greatest former books store employee turned rapper. Uh, Kai the Bookseller from his album Bookstore Raps. This is his song, A Fool Believes. 
parentheses like a fool. Brackets in parentheses, the book's seller song. Take it away. I'm bad, return to sad Jump in my seat as it starts to spat Shout out loud and let it roll One for the road, hey barkeep Kick me awake if I start to sleep I'm back from the dead, I'm back from the deep I'm back from the days with the console weep Once I was a fool for love But I was tricked, treated like a trick for sure Kick my ass out the door Little that I know I wasn't your One and only lover, deep undercover Transfer, and around again I never knew what I got myself in Damn this girl had flipped my mind Got me stressed and I couldn't find Figure out what she's all about Settle and learn how she works around If I could have seen the writing Looked in her eyes, she was always hiding Maybe I could have saved myself Maybe I could have backed it out But I was a tool, treated as a fool If I had only learned the rules She smiles, she winks Get us off the boy, it gets you the thing Like a fool I used to think I'll play the game Then I got tricked by this dirty dame I think her name was Diana Or maybe it's not, so what have you Got to say about the way I rolled my dice, got the trade Every day I thought I had it All it became was a bad habit Everywhere I went, I was all the same I just seen a girl with a different dude But I just blew it off, I wasn't in the mood What could I do, what could I prove Riding by, I would catch a stare Looked to my side, but she wasn't there Why would I just check the scene? I felt just like a jealous teen Cody to run with numb the pain Numb the thoughts, having their way Until one day I got a call This dude and my girl were spotted at a bar Now I could just have that get dumb Started a fight, started a brawl But I just slid in, girl on my arm Gave a little blink, gave a little nod She smiles, she winks Yeah, it's all just a boy, it hits you the thing It up, erased the mistake Sipping on sake with my new girl And that just seemed to piss her off Do I give a fuck? Hell no, man I just wanna say to you The games that you played ain't nothing new I've been there before, done them before Played them before, slayed them before So don't you go and act almighty I see that look that you glance slightly What can you say? What can you do? You tossed that first, now I'm through with you It may have hurt bad like a game to slicing But I flipped back Rearrange everything, now it's all even par in this silly game I'm all through now, nothing more to explain To think I was a fool for your love She smiles, she winks, yeah it's all just a boy It gets you the thing What a fool believes, what a fool can see She's all that you want, but you're watching her leave Notes from the bookstore. I love that song. I really do. I love that song. It's a good song. Yeah. I love that song. Big fan of Kai's music. I wish I still had his demo. 
because it's like that thing where you listen to you have one song from an artist, but you listen to that one song so much that you're like, damn, I need to find more from this artist. Because if this one song is good, Mm -hmm. what about the others? Yeah, that's why I just recently downloaded eight Butthole Surfer albums. I have one Uh Butthole Surfer song that I love so much that I'm like, damn it, I need to go into Butthole Surfers now. (laughs) <laughs> and it's not pepper i just want to be clear it's not their one hit yeah i feel bad for the band butthole surfers man we're gonna be angry and punk and we're gonna we're gonna experiment and do whatever we want and what we have a hit now damn it <laughs> damn it man we never wanted to be popular seriously we're number one on trl oh god damn it <laughs> Damn it, Carson Daly is talking about how much he likes our song. How did we get here? Yes. So let's pause things there for now in the uh, origin world and talk about what's going on on the book floor. Let's go, let's go on to the book floor now and talk about books. Can you believe, Bunny, that we are still getting crap for that freaking Milo Yiannopoulos book? Really? Yes! Still... Still getting the business. We're still getting the business. The runaround, the rigmarole for this. I can't believe this. Now here's now here's a recap. Um, Milo Yiannopoulos, he's a uh, extreme right wing agitator, uh, alt right, Breitbart, yada yada yada. So this guy gets a major book deal, gets the, a huge amount of money from a major publisher, and then people say, hey, uh, that's wrong because this guy thinks that uh, gays should all be killed and Muslims should be turned into snakes. I don't know. Well, so, what really what really killed him is he pretty much came out in favor of pedophilia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, so due to public pressure the book publisher drops his book deal. So he, he had already written the book. So he self published it. And because the alt right is the alt right. And because people aren't really buying books as much as they used to, it became a hit. It became such a hit online and Amazon and yada, 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 that suddenly people were coming into the bookstore and saying, how come you don't have Milo Yiannopoulos' book? This is obviously a liberal conspiracy. Mm -hmm. So then finally we did get the book in, but now people are saying, how come you don't have Milo Yiannopoulos' book? I can't believe this liberal company. I am never coming back. Actually, sir, we do have it. It's back over here in our political section. Actually, it's not a political section. Our our domestic, uh, our our domestic uh, policy section. It's our politics section. It's back over here by magazines. Let me take you over there. Yeah. But now what they're saying is, they're not saying how dare you don't carry Milo Yiannopoulos' book. Now they're saying, how dare you not have Milo Yiannopoulos' book right in front of your store? Why don't you have it in the front? Right in front of the doors. This is a New York Times bestseller. And that, my friends, is what I want to end the show talking about. The New York Times freaking bestseller list. Yes. You see, despite what every 69-year-old cranky old woman thinks, the New York Times bestseller list is bull. And it is easily conned. So here is how you con the New York Times. If you have a big enough bank account, you can easily buy your way onto the New York Times bestseller list. I have known this for a long time. People who work with bookstores for a long time already know this. I have worked with this company for almost 17 years, and I have worked with a number of employees. Well, well, I've worked with a bajillion and a half people and of all of those people i have worked with a handful of people who in their travels have worked at new york times sampling stores the way that new york times uh compiles their new york times bestseller list um is what did you just stick on me maxwell you sticked dirty computer tape on me that is really weird maxwell 
that you would just randomly tape this into my armpit. But, uh, you know what? You do you. I, I know, just, just maybe not just attack people with that tape. That was really weird. Um, and in 15 years, a new fetish is born. Uh-huh. That's a Japanese website. Yeah. So what the you'll New York go to Times like X hamster or something like that, and you'll see yeah. Yeah. armpit taping yeah. as as a whole category. Yeah. So the New York Times randomly chooses bookstores all across the nation, but primarily New York City, and tabulates their sales of books. But once these stores are discovered, there are there are people, there are companies, there are organizations that will literally call every bookstore across America. Hello, are you a New York Times sampling store? Yeah. And once the word gets out that you are a New York Times sampling store, um, uh, authors, publishers, and private companies will take advantage of that. This is what they do. A publisher who wants a new book to be successful will find a New York Times sampling store. Oh, give me a kiss, Maxwell. I love you. Love you. Good night. Love you. Good night. Good you want to say good night, Maxwell? Good night, bunny. Good night, Maxwell. So, the publisher or the author or the private company that the author has hired or that the publisher has hired will find a New York Times sampling store. Then what they will do is they will do a bulk order, usually somewhere between 250 and 500 copies of, let's say, Bill O'Reilly's new book. Yeah. Then it, they, they purchase these massive boxes of, here's my 500 copies of Bill O'Reilly's new book. Then they will go back to that same store two weeks later and return all of them. Oh. This happens all of the time and across America. It has to be a low number, though. It has to be 200 copies, 250, 300, 400, so that the New York Times doesn't catch on. Yeah. So if you try and order, yes, I would like to purchase 1,500 copies uh, of uh, Steve's new book, Booksellers Make Great Lovers. Yes. Then the New York Times goes, okay, well, that's obviously cheating. But Bill O'Reilly buying 200 copies of his book throughout America, there's no way I can notice that. Yeah. So you have to spread it. The, the, the magic number, the magic number is at least 5,000 copies. You have to sell at least 5,000 copies in one week in order to make the New York Times bestseller list. Now, ordering 200 copies of your new book at one store, that's not going to make a dent. But you spread that across 300, 500, 800 stores across America, you have got a bestseller on your hands. Oh, uh, huh. Okay. Sometimes it's an author. Sometimes it's a publisher. Sometimes that's too much work for you. So you can literally hire a company to do that for you. In 2013, Forbes magazine had a very interesting profile on one of these companies. They're called Result Source, all one word. And there is a company, and you hire them to make your book a success. You pay them a crap ton of money, and they will guarantee that you can say, New York Times bestselling author, Bunny Williams. Huh. There's also the fact that there are a number of New York Times bestseller lists. People say, oh, well, it's number one on the New York Times bestseller list. But what you don't realize is there is a New York Times bestseller list for fiction, for nonfiction, for kids books, for uh, gardening books, yeah. for teen books, for teen romance books, for teen science fiction books, for home improvement books. And it's like, you might not be the number one New York Times bestseller. You just might be, you might have been number 183 on the New York Times bestseller list for adult-oriented computer design books. Yes. But still, you get to put New York Times bestselling author on your book. So this is a scam, a successful scam. 
So many big name authors do this, especially conservative authors. This is what they do. They will make sure that every bookstore across America gets maybe five copies of their new book. Meanwhile, they go off to the side and do the 500 copy scam. So then old people see, wait a second, this conservative book is on the New York Times bestseller list. I'm going to go to my store looking for it. Yes. And then poor guys like me say, I'm sorry, we're all sold out. Why are you sold out? This is on the New York Times bestseller list. It's creating a false demand and it's BS and it works. Yes. Normal people don't know about this, but it happens all the time. It is the bane of my existence. So is Milo on the best-selling list? He is on the best-selling list. Yeah. He is on the best-selling list, despite the fact that that up until like two a month ago, no major bookstore carried it on the shelf. Yeah. There is a good chance that he bought his own copies of the book and then said, this is the New York Times bestseller list. How come Walmart doesn't carry it? Walmart should carry it. If they don't carry it and it's a New York Times bestseller list, then it's obvious that Walmart hates Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> it's a scam. It happens all the time and it works. And it you try and tell people that, no, it's not that. Well, how come you didn't order more copies of the book? We, we ordered as many as we can. This is actually a scam and you're falling for it. These are things we can't tell you, customers. Yeah. But it's very rare for this scam not to work. But that is what happened recently with the alleged teen book Handbook for Mortals by first-time author Lant Serum. Yes. I say alleged teen book because literally no one has this book. It's the first book in a series and the first book published by website geeknation.com. The book isn't available on Amazon. And here's the thing. Everything is available on Amazon. I can buy a five-gallon jug of horse urine if I wanted to, and <laughs> it will arrive at my house in two days. But I can't buy Handbook for Mortals by Lance Serum. <laughs> the book is also not available at Barnes and Noble stores or at BN.com, which I would once again like to say that this podcast is in no way affiliated with. So here's how this scam failed. No one has this book. You can't get the book. You can't buy the book. The only way you can buy the book is through the author's own personal website. And yet, this they, it, geeknation.com did no press for it. There was no book tour. There were no commercials for it. They yeah. did no advertising for it. But suddenly, this book is on, number one on the New York Times teens bestseller list past these other major books that are really huge. And so people are like, wait a second. Why is this book that it, finally a few people are like, wait, why is this book that no one carries, number one on the New York Times bestseller list? And they did some investigating and they found out that apparently the author and the publisher are like, hey, Hollywood, uh, we are the most popular. We are the most powerful people in Hollywood because we are the authors and owners of a teen trilogy. <laughs> And Hollywood's like, you own a teen trilogy? Oh, thank God. We are desperate for stuff. Do you know how many streaming things there are right now? Yeah. <laughs> Everything is has a streaming channel. We desperately need content. Wait a second. Is your teen series popular? Yes. In fact, we uh, are. Uh, the first book in the series is about to hit the New York Times bestseller list. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, so some people went looking around and it turns out, yeah, yeah, absolutely. This book, literally, they just did the, the 5,000 copies scam. Yeah. And it re it just a few days ago, the New York times officially pulled the book handbook for mortals from their New York times bestseller list. Oh, that's not fair. Yeah, well, it, like I can understand, I can understand why they did it. You know, it, it, I'm. You know, they were just trying to get a, a movie deal. The mm -hmm. most powerful people in Hollywood are uh, teen authors with a trilogy. Yeah. Right. You know? 
so yeah. So what have we learned, Charlie Brown? We learned that scamming the New York Times is surprisingly easy to do. Yes. And 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 also, uh, yeah. If you really want to make money, uh, write teen sci-fi romances. They're really huge, uh, right? I'm glad that was a part of it, and it was probably a part of it all along. Notes from the bookstore. But I had seen an article, and because you had mentioned kind of what you were going to do. Yeah, last week. And I saw that article, and I, I sent it to you, which I'm sure you already knew. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But I, I'm happy that this is becoming a thing because I'm happy that the this story of the book Handbook for Mortals is causing normal non-bookseller people to fully realize how much of a scam the New York Times bestseller list is. Yeah. That's important because it's all kind of BS. <laughs> and if you want to... Basically, anyone can trick the system. That is so, that is interesting. Yeah, yeah. And that is it for, for notes from the bookstore this week. And remember, boys and girls and all of the above, you too can save 10% on all of your purchases. And all you have to do is find a teen sci-fi series with a female protagonist where she doesn't have to choose between two boys. Yes. That is harder than you think. I know your ears uh, like peaked up because it, you think I mentioned polyamory, but no, I'm mentioning how most teen book series with a female protagonist have... Freaking love triangles? Yeah, yeah. Freaking love triangles. Mm -hmm. It's harder than you would think to find a a teen sci-fi series with a female protagonist where she doesn't have to choose between two dreamy boys. <laughs> well, because don't you understand the whole existence of a female is basically just dependent upon a man. Yeah. That's how society believes females are. So yeah. Yep. You know where I learned that too from the Netflix anime glitter force. Yes. I'm just saying that, um, Henry, not only would it solve your problem, but it would give some power back to females instead. Because you always hear about fucking sister wives. There's a fucking show dedicated to it. A man can have four wives, but a woman can't have two boyfriends. Fuck that. <laughs> Walk away. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably a good idea. <laughs> 